everyone. I'm Natalie Kunzman, MD, and today we are talking about retroviruses. So what is a virus? Let's start there. Uh, this is a very interesting debate throughout time as to whether or not a virus is truly alive or not alive. So a lot of scientists, I would say myself included, will talk about a virus not truly being alive. There is potential. Uh, so I think of it a lot of times as a seed. A seed that you find in the dirt is not truly alive, but there is potential in that seed to have life-like properties. So a virus cannot live by itself. It doesn't metabolize. It doesn't have cellular uh, mechanics, but if it has the ability to hijack our own DNA and get there, it is used and metabolized within our DNA sequences to replicate and make more of itself. So a retrovirus itself is implying that it is using a RNA sequence to use a reverse transcriptase to incorporate in our DNA so that our DNA can make an RNA sequence to replicate it. Okay, so it's a little bit complicated, but it is different than most of the DNA viruses out there. Now, a lot of us are familiar with RNA type viruses uh, certainly many years ago when HIV came to town. That, of course, is a retrovirus, and we have a standard HTLV1 and 2 sub-variation. But what I'd like to talk about today is actually HERV. Now, what is that referring to? It is human endogenous retroviruses. Okay, so endogenous implies that it is within our virome, and that indeed is true. In fact, potentially 8% of our genome, of our genetics, is composed of these endogenous retroviruses, and the abbreviation for them is HERVs. Now, these HERVs have been proposed to be within our genome for well over millions of years, and they have co-evolved within our DNA and have propagated throughout time. So there's a big debate about whether this is commensal or whether this is truly problematic. So I want to say hold on to your hats because I think it is both arms of sometimes being problematic and sometimes being beneficial. Now, the topic of herbs came up a little while ago with a patient and with some of Dr. Klinghart's discussions about these retroviruses actually co-infecting other organisms. So retroviruses may not just be within the uh, mammalian kingdom and the human kingdom, they are actually proposed to co-infect some ticks and in some of the tick-borne illnesses such as Lyme, you are not only dealing with Lyme, but you are dealing with the co-infection of these retroviruses that have actually infected the spirochete. And we know that viruses do infect bacteria. So uh, th this can get quite complicated. So back to herbs and the co and. Uh, um, the evolution within our DNA. And if you don't think this is an issue, you can watch the pharmaceutical company right now trying very hard to work on strategies to target these herbs because they have been 
associated with the MS patient, the ALS patient, and there's even some research uh, going after some of the chronic autoimmunity, particularly so with a psoriatic patient. So again, this speaks to the, is the HERV potentially yielding a chronic inflammatory response in some of the autoimmune patients, creating a cellular mimicry approach? And is it giving the chronic immunity cellular mimicry with those proposed autoimmune neurologic conditions. So if it is causing a problem, that surely does become a good target. Now these herbs are also potentially either activating or modulating our innate immunity. Now the innate immunity is that early immune response, that T cell response, and potentially it is helpful with that innate response and not necessarily only propagating chronic uh, autoimmunity. Now, some of the other potential indications or consequences of having these herbs is, does it actually help with exogenous infections coming in. So if we are getting exposed to other vir viruses or bacteria, are they helpful? And again, we see a yes, we see a no on both sides of the coin. Now, herbs and cancer has been proposed to potentially be immunosuppressive, and that might contribute to cancer progression. In other words, cancer is bypassing some of our normal innate immune responses. But on the other side of the coin, if we have herbs that are upregulating in some cancer tissues, and it has given, let's say, broad uh, epigenetic like dysregulation, we now have a target that we can go after, and this model is being used in some of the anti-cancer uh, strategies, treatments, and chemotherapies. So, again, if 8% of our DNA has these herbs, do we find that it is of benefit? And if we do not have benefit with some of these herbs that want to remain in an activated state, what approaches do we have to blockade the effect and there are some postulations of um, energetic techniques that can help quiet down these retroviruses in addition to some herbal tinctures and some natural remedies that will help balance the immune system back. And I, I often think if they have evolved with us, there presumably was a purpose or a benefit at one point, but in today's ever evolving world of toxicity, of harming our epigenetics, what may be have been of benefit at one point has now unleashed or untamed a condition that really needs to get balanced out again. And I know this may sound quite esoteric or possibly unbelievable, but there are very smart people at the labs as we speak going after these herbs to work with autoimmune treatment, cancer treatments, 
and balancing the immune system when some of the infectious battles are not being won as in the case of Lyme disease. Okay, there you have it. This topic will be going on and on and on throughout the upcoming years. And any information that you have or your experience with this, you may please uh, submit comments below and we all can chat and learn from each other. You also can find me for consultation and medical management of all of your functional and regenerative needs at nataliekunzmanmd.com.